ecological relevance. Um, oh, okay. So uh, what is it all about? I am going to comment on it in detail, but before I go there, let me briefly introduce to you how the system works. Can you see my slide changing? I think there's a slight delay, that's all right. So the system itself comprises of four compartments that are connected via tube-shaped corridors. So what you see right away is that this is a housing environment that serves as experimental environment at the same time. So we have four compartments and they are connected via those tube-shaped corridors and we can house groups of animals as large as up to 12 uh, in the system for basically as long as we like. This is an RFID-based system, which means that uh, it's based on the radio um, frequency identification. The antennas that are placed here on every single corridor of the system record the individual numbers of each animal, and they are transpondered with those teeny tiny chips um, that are put under their skin. So every animal has its individual number. The antennas, they are able to read those numbers and transmit it to the control unit that is located here um, in the very center of the system. What is most important about it though, is that every EcoHub in our uh, laboratory right now has its experimental box cupboard um, that separates it from the outer environment. And it also provides it with individual ventilation. You probably can see that, but over every single cage, we have those ventilators that are taking the smells away from directly over them. It's important because in EcoHab, we have a lot of experiments that are scent based. So we don't want them spreading around. Additionally, we have standardized system of how much light there is being delivered to every single compartment of the apparatus. Again, it's important because we want to make sure that any and every behavior that we are testing is not going to be dependent on the diverse uh, light propensities within the specific uh, parts of the environment. But as I said before, before we go into the technicalities, the most important characteristic of the system, it's its ecological and ecological relevance. And how did we come about um, to have it uh, look as it does today? So. We started from very old papers from the 70s and 80s and asked a question, how does the home for uh, rodents such as mice look like in the wild? And I hope you are going to excuse me the quality of those pictures on the right. They come from really old papers, but it doesn't make them any less relevant. On the contrary, what is very well known by now is that in nature, mice live in those burrows that are dug underground. And usually they also contain nesting material, as can be seen here. By the way, uh, this is a very similar graphic taken from a paper that was uh, published 30 years later. It's astonishing similar, which speaks to the importance of how this housing for housing, well, nesting and borrowing for mice looks like and how stable it is, and probably uh, how much uh, it depends on their natural uh, behavior, probably. Uh, it's determined at least to some part, as this paper says, uh, due to the specific genetics of the species. So what is important here is that mice live in those burrows and every burrow is connected to the rest of the environment via those corridors, uh, tunnels that are dug underground. And important characteristic is that there's always more than one. It's very important for the mice apparently to always have the way out. So you can see in both those pictures here and there that there is another tunnel that leads towards the surface of the ground, but it does not go all the way out which is very smart, I think, because on one hand, it makes it safe for those rodents not to be invaded by any predator here from the outside. But in, uh, in case of an emergency, they can very fast dig out, out of there. So this characteristic of how animals live and the fact that they always have at least one burrow connected via two tunnels, at least, 
made us look some more. And we found those studies that show that usually when given a chance, animals are actually building way more complex environments um, when it comes to burrows and tunnels. I don't know if you see my cursor, but what I am trying to show here is that there is, uh, when given a chance, animals are building a couple of burrows here on the plane of a quadrant. Here one, there another one, and there it is, the third one. And they are connected in a way that animals can always go to waste. So we tried to figure out how we can translate it into laboratory reality. And we figured out, okay, probably it's not feasible to let animals dig. Uh, that would not be <laughs> reproducible and, uh, you know, wouldn't be very prudent of us. But maybe we can offer them the environment that is going to resemble what they would call home in the wild. And this is how EcoHub came about. So we have four cages that are connected via tube-shaped corridors. And every single one of those cages has at least has exactly two ways out. So we hope that this kind of environment is going to enable us to elicit naturalistic social behaviors, the patterns of behaviors, grouping, interacting that would be there under natural conditions for the rodents. Um, this is just to show you that, as Evelina mentioned in her introduction, the way to obtaining the actual architecture of EcoHub that we have today has been very long. There was a lot of trial and error as to the shape, size, length, how big the cages should be, how wide the corridor should be, what shape should they have. So what we have today, this is only to show you, it's not a matter of an accident, this has been tried in many, many experiments, and this is what animals seem to prefer. And this is what enables us to, as I said before, elicit those naturalistic patterns of social behavior. So I told you already a little bit of uh, on how EcoHub works. You know that there are four cages and RFID system that allows us to register their activity and how they move and how they aggregate um, throughout the territory. What I have not said yet is that there are two types of cages. Two this one type has food, water, and shelter in it. And the other two, they are basically empty. They only have this perforated partition. It's transparent so animals can see through it and can smell through it, but they cannot drag out and um, spread it through the rest of the territory, whatever is hidden behind this perforated partition. And we usually use it to present animals with sources of social sense, specifically, most commonly, novel social sense. So it would just be bedding soaked in the urine of an unknown mouse. The data that is being connected um, with the antennas is then transformed and collected via customized electronics. And the computer that is steering the EcoHub, because we are not trying to interfere with the experiments as little as possible, as you saw, those are uh, those apparatus, they are being separated from the environment and they are being steered via computer. Uh, so the data is being collected via computer with the use of the software called EcoHub RFID. And then they can be analyzed with the package of software. Those are just scripts written in Python, readily available on GitHub. Anybody can download them and produce a result such as this. This one, um, I am going to be commenting on specific types of uh, social uh, behaviors and uh, variables that we usually analyze. When you go to our GitHub page, you can download those scripts and uh, with their use, you can easily analyze uh, some of those variables, the most basic ones, at least. Um, we are very open to people changing the scripts, uh, downloading them, doing whatever they want with them. This is purely open science. Uh, so if you would be interested in that, please uh, just go ahead and visit our GitHub page. So this is how the whole system works. Uh, what is most important though, is what kind of social behaviors we can actually investigate. And the most basic measure of social behavior that we do investigate is social approach or social preference towards novel social stimuli. I should briefly comment on why we are not using other mice as social stimuli as some uh, researchers uh, do. So from field studies, we know very well that it's not really adaptive to approach an unknown individual of the same sex 
very willingly and without reservations. It turns out that when given a chance, wild mice usually avoid such sorts of interactions and uh, because they can easily become aggressive interactions. So they are risky uh, uh, in, and, uh, in their nature. However, what they always do is that they investigate social scents that are being left throughout their territory, indicating unknown mice. Because it might be, for example, somebody who is coming to take over my territory and my resources, or maybe it can be um, uh, an individual of another sex with whom I should mate. I, I see Sabine has, Sabine, I don't yes, know if I'm pronouncing you. this, or please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, just to your point here, what you just said, does that apply to both sexes? Apparently so. So also females avoid interacting with unknown females in the wild? So yes, the, the paper that I am referring to is from the 70s, and I am quite mm -hmm. sure that it concerned both sexes, but I, I would go ahead and check it out for you if you'd like. Yes, please. That would be great. Yes. Thank you very much. So it, you're very welcome. So uh, commenting on this a little bit more, it all obviously it happens less that females become aggressive, but nevertheless, we know strains uh, that have aggressive females and we coped with them in our own experiments. Uh, so it's not completely uncommon. Okay, back to our uh, testing of social approach versus uh, um, um, of novel social stimuli. So what we do is we take those scents and present them behind the perforated partitions. On one side, we have social order, for the control condition, we have non-social order presented at the exact same time. And what we are measuring here is the time animals spend on investigating both those others. We calculate then the proportion time spent on those investigations and additionally divide it by the exact same measure taken from 24 hours prior. Why? Uh, those of you who work with mice probably know that they, are, they always have their own small preferences. They like certain spaces, don't like other spaces so much. So it's important for us to know that the preference that we are observing is not due to the fact that they like this particular compartment. It's due to the fact that we are presenting them with social sense. So uh, this is a brief example of how data uh, can be shown. The most conventional way to do it uh, is basically uh, shown here. So we can create graphs. Those are two groups of mile, mice, wild types, and knockouts. The specifics are not important. This is just an example. And uh, we can see that on the y-axis, there is um, social preference presented as a number. This is a proportion. That's why it takes, um, that's why it takes values from zero, zero to infinity. The way I prefer to present the data is in a logarithmic way. And this is the example seen here above. This is the exact same data, but this time the data is shown for specific mice. Those are the data points here. And it is being shown for cohorts of animals that have been tested. So we had two cohorts of mice that were wild types and three cohorts of mice that, are, uh, that were knockouts. And you can see that due to the logarithmic scale, the preference for social order, so everything that we have above zero, can be placed in the exact same uh, mathematical space from zero to infinity as counter preference from zero to minus infinity. So uh, this is just, I think, easier to look at. Uh, OK, so uh, this is one way we can show the data. In this case, we are comparing between the two groups, knockouts and wild types. But we can also do uh, within subject comparisons, if you would be interested in that. Um, when we first uh, produced EcoHub, we did a series of experiments where we had two EcoHubs placed in two different laboratories, and we tested the same mice the same groups of mice twice in terms of approach to social order. So uh, you can see the data from two repetitions from both knockouts and wild types, but this is less important on the same axis. So this is num animal number one, two, and so forth. And as you can see, I think it's a remarkable reproducibility here. I think we got really lucky with this result, to be honest, because it seems like it's very, very coherent. Nevertheless, um, 
you can do experiments in which you test your animals twice, either within the same system or two systems that are uh, um, in two different uh, uh, in two different venues. That's not an issue. And you also can per, uh, uh, perform experiments in which you will have a group of mice do some treatment on them and then retest them in the very same environment. And obviously have, at the same time have control groups uh, without treatment or with mock treatment or whatever. So this is one of the ways such data could be presented. We have also figured out that it would be very nice to understand more about the ways animals are sniffing. And this is why uh, we have been working on the system called Laser Curtain 4, um, shining the light on the perforated partition. And as you can see, this croissant shape appears when animal is sniffing the partition. Here is the camera record, recording all the, uh, enabling us to record all those images that you can see on the right. So what is exciting about it is that we can record a lot of animals sniffing at the same time. And we have been working on developing a system that is going to enable us to differentiate between them, to have specific data on sniffing behavior of um, individual mice. So this was approach to social others, predominantly about how animals investigate novel social stimuli. Another measure that I am about to introduce is all about how animals respond to familiar social stimuli. And the basic measure we use for this purpose is called in cohort sociability. As I've commented on before, in EcoHab, it is possible for the animals to either congregate within one certain space or spread around throughout the apparatus and spend as little time with one another as possible if they don't like to do so. So we can measure how willingly they are spending their time with one another. And this is an example for two pairs of animals within a group because we can measure this uh, specific um, variable for pairs of animals, every pair of animals within a given tested cohort. We have animal A and animal B and animal A and animal C. On the vertical axis, you can see numbers of compartments of the EcoHab. And right away, those bars, this is time, are representing where those animals are spending their time. So you can see that a B pair spends a lot of time within the same spaces within the EcoHab. On the contrary, a C pair, not so much. So based on the time they spend in specific compartments, we can calculate A, uh, how much time they spend together within those compartments. And this is our basic measure that we call time actually spent together. But from it, we want to subtract what would be random time spent together based on the fact that A, EcoHub is not an unlimited space. So they, they are constrained. They, they cannot go wherever. So they have to be somewhere. And secondly, as I said before, animals tend to prefer certain spaces. So it's quite important for us to be able to control for the fact that they may be within the same box, not because they like one another, quote unquote, but because they just like the same space. So we subtract this random, quote unquote, time spent together and end up with the actual measure of in cohort sociability, which is just the excess of time animals spend together above the chance level. And this data can be represented as the matrices that I have been pointing to. Every single cell in those matrices represents one pair of mice. The redder the color, the more time spent together. I should be pointing here right now. So you can see right away that this cohort is pretty prone to spending time together. The same data, though, can be calculated um, in the same way, but presented differently. And you can see here in the left bottom uh, panel, um, two histograms, again, shown for the control and the experimental group specifics, not important. What is important here is that on the vertical axis, we are presenting the percentage of pairs and on the horizontal one, the value of in cohort sociability. So this leftward shift of the histogram for the uh, manipulated group for the experimental group indicates that those animals, they tend to be less prone to spend time with each other voluntarily than the control group. And you can see it right away. So in cohort sociability enables us uh, to say how sociable animals are 
towards familiar conspecifics. Approach to social others usually tells us how they respond to novel social stimuli. And um, I would like to take a brief moment to comment on why is it even beneficial for us to have various approaches and various measure, measures of social behavior. So it turns out, because both those measures have been with us uh, from the very beginning of the development of the system, that by now we have some very interesting um, results that indicate that in different mouse models of genetic disorders, we can find diverse social phenotypes. For example, in the group of one of our collaborators, it was found that SRF knockouts, animals that with the del deletion in the serum response factor, have this specific phenotype of disinterest in familiar social stimuli. I think by now you can see right away that this matrix, uh, the colors of this matrix indicate that those animals are disinterested in spending time, time with one another. The same data is represented here as a histogram. But at the same time, they have no problem of being interested approaching novel social stimuli. So having those two measures tells us something more granular about the type of social deficit that we observe in this specific phenotype. On the other hand, we have different, completely different model. This time we are talking about the genetic model that is specific to astrocytes. And we are talking about the, the deletion of the TCF7L2 gene. So in this case, we are observing something completely different. Not only are those animals hyper interested in spending time with familiar conspecifics, they are also hyper interested in novel social stimuli. So completely different phenotype based on this, um, uh, based on this genetic mouse model. And this time we have two measures that are changing in the same direction. But from the previous example, we very well know that it does not have to be the case. So that having more measures of social behavior, and I am going to talk about other measures um, in a second, enables us to be more granular, more particular in defining specific characteristics of the phenotype of our interest. Uh, speaking about other measures of social behavior, uh, we have recently been developing um, social networks um, based on the data collected in the EcoHub. This time we are not looking at what animals are doing within the specific compartments of the system. This time we are looking at their dynamic social behavior, specifically how they follow one another through the panels of the system. So here you can see an example. We define following as an event when mouse, when one mouse enters the tube, and another one enters behind it and they are leaving in the same direction. So we already subtracted all the events when animals are head to head or changing their mind and going back uh, to the cage um, from which they came for, from. We are looking at the specific behavior of one mouse following the other, going after it to the new space within the apparatus. And this sort of following data can be shown as a nod edge representation where the size of the circle, I, I hope you can see my cursor, um, uh, somebody could give me a feedback on that. Um, so uh, the, si the, size of the size of the circle indicates how much this Season particular, table. perfect, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, the size of the circle indicates how this animal follows other animals and the thickness of the edge between two animals represents what is happening within this specific pair of mice. So this kind of data, to this kind of data, we can apply to page rank analysis. Very similar one uh, to um, the algorithm developed by Google to score web pages and say which one of them should be scored higher in their search engines. We can see which mice are more critical uh, within the social network. And we see two very interesting characteristics. First of all, we can present a social network for the whole cohort based on this following behavior. And it's remarkably stable in the environment that is well known to the individual. So as animals become adapted to the social space, 
the social networks they form, they are being very stable. However, when we introduce some kind of disruption to the environment, for example, we introduce social sense that indicate important things, such as that an individual has been exposed to highly rewarding resource, such as 10% secure solution. It turns out that the social network tends to change very rapidly. And more importantly, it changes in an asymmetric way. The individuals that have been very important within a network from the beginning, such as this one and this one, increase their following behavior unproportionately in comparison to the rest of the group. So not only are the social networks that we find quite stable, but they are also the structure of the network responds to what animals encounter within the environment, and it represents very well which animals have been important within a network from the very beginning. Another thing that is uh, often asked about is can we measure social hierarchy within the EcoHub? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, this is a first type of add-on to the EcoHub that I am presenting. Please mind that this time we only have one corridor by design that leads to the side cage. And within the side cage, we have teeny tiny tunnel that enables only one animal to stick their head in at the time. And within it, there is a tip of the bottle containing 10% super solution, as you already know, highly motivating uh, reward. So what we do in those experiments is that we expose animals to these uh, environment, we allow them to explore it for some time, and then we restrict the access and only give them ability to drink this highly rewarding solution for two hours per day. And we continue giving them ac restricted access for three subsequent days. Based on who has access to highly uh, rewarding resource that is very limited, we are scoring animals and saying who's the most dominant and who's the least dominant. The most dominant animals we define as the ones that are monopolizing the access uh, to the bottle with sucrose. So here you can see the ranks of the animals in three subsequent days of the experiments. And what, what you can see right away is that who's dominant and who's submissive is very stable. The same animals that drink the most from day, on day one, they drink the most on day two and day three. And the same goes for the subordinates who never get any access, basically. The rest of the social uh, hierarchy is a little more flexible. And we are actually very much interested in those animals. We have experiments during which we test those subjects. One of our PhD students uh, is um, actually developing the technology of chronic implantation of uh, silicon probes, neuropixels to be exact. And what we are doing is that animals are housed in the EcoHub. Their domination submission uh, score is being calculated. And then we record from the neurons in their prefrontal cortex with the use of the silicon probes while presenting them with social sense taken from the animals that are either dominant or subordinate. So those are the guys from the middle of social hierarchy and in them, uh, the recordings are being done because we are interested in how dominance, dominant versus submissive status is being encoded by the activity of the neur those neurons during the presentations of those smells. So you see uh, already that uh, EcoHub um, uh, behavioral testing can be very well combined with advanced method of testing um, neuronal activity. Another thing that we are routinely testing in EcoHub is social learning. Um, this time, the experiment is really simple, and it's based on what I have already told you about. We can separate certain individuals from the group and expose them to rewarding or punishing stimuli. In the experiments, um, on which I am commenting on right now, we have presented one animal with conventional housing cage with water for 24 hours and the other animals had access to 10% sucrose solution. And then we collected scents of those animals, the bedding from those teeny tiny housing cages, and we presented them back into the eco hub to the rest of the cohort. Those animals never came back uh, 
not to confuse uh, the group that is being tested on. So what is important here is that usually familiar social stimuli are nothing that exciting, right? They come from known animals. But what we see right away when we present a scent that indicates that the conspecific that is well known has been introduced to something very interesting outside of our housing, ex uh, our housing environment, it turns out that animals are very much interested in it. And this is being indicated in the red bars here in all of the graphs. So first of all, we can measure how they approach such sense if they are interested in investigating them, but we can also calculate how persistent they are. The natural behavior, uh, of mice usually is that they first explore sense very intensely for the first couple of hours at most, and then they just leave it be. And they also evaporate because those are sense, right? So what we see in those experiments on social learning is that when animals find social cue in the environment once, they are later on very persistent in keeping looking at the space where the cue was left. Also, we can take a look at the social structure represented by the number of followings within a cohort. And you can see that when the indication, social indication of reward appears in the environment, the following behavior increases very much for the whole cohort. Another version of the same experiment that is being enabled um, uh, to be done due to our uh, due to us having a couple of eco hubs that are stored in identical spaces, as you can see here uh, in the graphic to the left, we have three levels. So we can move animals from one level to another. And in this case, we were very much interested in how animals are enabled to adapt to novel environment based on the social cues that are left there by their familiar conspecific. Very briefly, because this is only for you to uh, get to understand what kind of experiments can be done with the system. So we have a group of animals that are housed in one eco hub, let's say here on this level, and then we separate from this groups, group two individuals and we allow them to enter a completely new space, clean apparatus, let's say on the first floor. So those two animals, they are called, called scout by us, scouts they are exposed to water and sucrose solution. This time, uh, we don't have perforated partitions. We have those add-ons, again, with teeny tiny uh, collars equipped with the antennas that enable only one animal to drink at the time. And the scout mice have access to water and sucrose solution in two different spaces within a new apparatus. They can do whatever they want for 24 hours. And obviously, they leave social cues their sense all over the place. After this phase is done, those two animals go out of the experiment and never come back. But the rest of the group is being moved from the first apparatus to the second one. The bottles have been removed, but this, so the sucrose solution is no longer available. We swap the bottles for the new ones with clean water, both of them. But one side has been indicated as one that contained sucrose solution by the social sense that were left by the scout mice. So again, what we can measure is how animals respond in this novel environment with social cues left in it. And we can see, again, uh, please take a look at the red bars, that animals are very persistent in drinking from the bottle. They both contain water, right? In drinking from the bottle um, that previously, uh, that previously, um, or rather is located in a place where there was previously a bottle with sucrose solution. And also the following behavior of those mice is being significantly increased. So this is just to show you that having more than one apparatus enables you to ask questions about how animals learn socially in not only known, but also novel environments. And to top it all off, I would like to briefly introduce the fact that uh, we have um, created something called EcoHub Field. We have those pens in which we have compartments connected via underground corridors in the field, in, our out, uh, in the outfield station of our institute. The idea is exactly the same. Uh, those are EcoHub antennas. We have underground corridors. This time they are underground. And there is two ways out from every compartment uh, of this apparatus. In the middle, you can see the electronics. And uh, those tunnels are the only way 
that animals can commute between different compartments. Here is a brief video that we recorded uh, during our first pilot experiments. Animals were very, very happy. Those are uh, regular C57 BL6 laboratory mice. Uh, so nothing special about them. They were very eager uh, to explore the space uh, spread throughout the whole apparatus. As you can see, it's quite large. It's two meters by two meters. Um, the flashing lights here uh, indicate working electronics. And you see in the ground, those tiny holes, they are the entrances to the underground corridors uh, that connect the whole space. Here is, here is the feeder and the bottle of water uh, because obviously um, we wanted to control where animals can eat. So yes, this is how it looks like. Uh, what we did in those experiments is we, um, diversified the value of subterritory. Some of them contain food, some of them contain shelter material, some of them contained both. And uh, we were very interested in how territorial animals become when we leave them be in such a large environment, but also based on the kind of environment that we provide them with. So this is an example from our data at the time runs um, downwards. And what we can see is that different colors represent different spaces within the apparatus. What we can see right away is that over time, most animals prefer spending time in the territory that is most valuable, meaning the one that contains both food and shelter, regardless or of where they started from. So this is very exciting because us being able to assess uh, how the subgroups spread throughout such a large territory and which territories are being occupied most intensely uh, allows us to say something about the ter territoriality of those animals. So to summarize what I told you today, EcoHub enables you to test various forms of social behaviors. And you can do it simultaneously or sequentially, depending on the specific design that you are interested in and the questions that you want to address. I've mentioned social preference, predominantly used to assess uh, proneness to interact with novel social stimuli in cohort sociability, which says a lot about how animals are interested in interacting with familiar conspecific social networks and social hierarchy, but also various forms of social learning and recently even ter territoriality under semi-naturalistic conditions. I think the most exciting thing about uh, EcoHub testing is that you can combine it with various advanced methods of measuring neuronal activity. I have uh, uh, already commented on the fact that we have been developing experiments with the use of the silicon probes. We have a new line of research uh, in which we interspersingly image animals with the use of two photon microscopy as they are being housed within the EcoHub. We have also collaborators that are uh, telling us that they are thinking about implementing wireless photometry to measure neuronal activity uh, in animals that are housed within the EcoHub. We also routinely use uh, methods of manipulating neuronal activity such as chemogenetics. And we also um, implemented the system that is called Neurolux. Some of you may know it. It's commercially available wireless optogenetics and it seems to work uh, with EcoHub quite well. A very last word. Uh, I have been talking a lot about behavioral uh, neuroscience because this is what we do, but EcoHub has been used uh, way beyond that. Specifically, a lot of the labs that we work with and collaborators have been using it to phenotype various neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric mouse models. Um, and also specific molecular mechanisms and um, and also pharmacology experiments have been done to assess phenotypes and how animals look like in terms of their social behavior after specific treatments. The most uh, exotic from the point of view of our own research is that EcoHub has already been used in cancer research, pain management studies, and I think most excitingly, uh, immuno uh, test for using testing uh, immunotherapeutic drugs. So um, you can use, this is just a tool. And um, I think its capabilities allow us to use it in addressing uh, many different questions 
depending on what you are interested in, but uh, definitely its use can be way beyond um, behavioral neuroscience. With that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Uh, I am um, very much uh, open to any questions, if you have some. Uh, I would like to mention that we are looking for a PhD student. If you know any eager uh, individual uh, that would like to join our group, please send them our way. We would be very grateful for that.